Hello, my name is Dr. Prashant Deshpande. Welcome to Dr. D's Table Talk. The purpose of this video channel is to provide basic understanding of the common medical conditions and facts based on science. In this video channel, I plan to interview experts in the medical fields and want to cover topics ranging from vaccination to healthy diets and everything else in between. Welcome to another episode of Dr. D's Table Talk. We will be talking today with a sleep specialist about common sleep issues in infants and toddlers. My guest today is Dr. Darius Lagmani, who is the director of Children's Sleep Network at Advocate Children's Hospital. He treats entire spectrum of sleep problems in infants and children at Advocate and Not Short Health Systems. His primary focus is pediatric sleep medicine, and he is board certified in pediatrics and sleep medicine through American Board of Internal Medicine. He also has authored many chapters on pediatric sleep related conditions in pediatric and adult sleep medicine books. Welcome Dr. Lagwani. Let me jump in right away. What is sleep? What sleep is essentially is it's a state in which you are not responding to external stimuli. The brain itself is very active, but it's active in a completely different way than, uh, than when we're awake. And the body itself, every cell in the body functions differently at night than it does during the day. Uh, what is the difference between sleep in children and sleep in adults? Is there a difference? A good question. So the difference between sleep in children and adults really comes to a question of the, the total amount of sleep needed. And then there's also early, early in life, like the first couple of months, children's sleep is, is different in terms of the distinction between rapid eye movement sleep and non-rapid eye movement sleep. Um, early on, you only have two types of sleep. Mm -hmm. But then as you get older, you have uh, multiple stages of non-rapid eye movement sleep. Okay. So that, those technical issues aside, sleep becomes very similar, usually by one year of age. All the sleep types are there, and the patterns start to become very, very similar between children okay. and adults. Very interesting. Can you comment on some healthy sleep habits, such as co-sleeping? Or for that matter, why should a child or an infant sleep in his or her own crib or bed? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. what's, the, what's the philosophy behind it? What's your that's, advice for the parents? That's a good question. And where a child sleeps is affected by a number of different uh, elements. Because it's, it's, uh, it's not just the parent's decision. Sometimes there are, uh, there are constraints, right? If you only have one room, you have one bed, then the child, that's where the child sleeps. So we, we have to recognize that in our, in our society we have options that many other societies don't have, right? right. Co-sleeping is the norm in pretty much every culture pretty much in, because really there's one room and it's not just co-sleeping parents and children. It's parents, children, other family members often all live in the same, same place, sleep in the same room. Um, the biggest concern with co-sleeping is really the, uh, the risk of sudden infant death syndrome. And whenever we, we talk about this, of course, this is a terrifying uh, uh, concept. Uh, the fact that a child could, could we, we could lose this, this infant. Um, and so the stakes being that high, we of course are very, very um, uh, careful and we want to, we're mindful of what are the risk factors for sudden infant death syndrome. So when we think about that, really what we're looking at is how are we helping the child uh, I hope we make sure that the child is sleeping on a firm surface mm -hmm. because the, uh, the softer pillows, like the pillow top mattresses, those sort of things, it's hard for the child to move around because they're, you know, they, they don't have the ability early in life to lift up their heads right. or to, to roll over. Um, and so we want to make sure that, they're, that there's nothing that's going to make it harder for them to, to breathe. The other question is, is, uh, trying to keep them from overheating. 
So the amount of heat that they have, whether it's they're in like the clothes that they're sleeping in or the number of blankets on top of them, if we can limit those things, then um, we can we can decrease the risk of sudden infant death syndrome as well. Sure. Um, when it comes to parents, oh, go ahead, yeah. Most important would be sleeping on the back, correct? Yeah, so in terms of sleep position, like the, the sleeping on the back had a significant impact on the rates of sudden infant death syndrome. Um, and this was a, a big movement, the back to sleep movement from the from the 90s. It was one of the most successful public health interventions uh, that, that we've seen. Which is so, very simple and inexpensive to do. Exactly, exactly. So what we try and do is we really want to empower parents because we right. don't want to say, if you co-sleep, your child will die. God forbid, right? right? So right. we say, like, if, you, if, you, uh, if you're going to co-sleep, if this is something that you're doing, we just want you to be mindful of these risk factors. Sure. So you want to make sure you're co-sleeping on, a, on a, firm, a firm mattress, that you're not using a lot of pillows and that you don't, you're not using a lot of blankets. Also, if you're a smoker or if you are uh, somebody, somebody that is uh, uh, maybe overweight, like these are also risk factors for, the, for overlaying or uh, and ex- tobacco exposure itself is a risk factor for sudden infant death syndrome. Sure. So really... Firm surface, fewer she- fewer sheets and blankets, and uh, supine sleep is uh, are are ways to decrease the risks associated with co sleep. I am sure in your sleep practice, you often get asked this question: How long my child should take a nap? What are naps? How are they different from sleep at night? And how should it, how much should a child be sleeping uh, in infancy and in toddler age groups? It's a good question, and it is something that, that parents are very concerned about. And this is something that, really, I hope that all of, your, all of your patients and your viewers really kind of keep in mind. The National Sleep Foundation has put out ranges our, in terms of like how many hours a child should sleep at different ages. Um, those, those data are based on phone surveys. So they would call a parent and they'd say, how long did your child sleep? They'd write down the number and then they'd, they'd call the next parent. And then they would just average those. So I don't know about, about you, but I don't know necessarily how many minutes or how many hours mm-hmm. my child slept exactly. But so really the way to look at those is not like a prescription. It's not your child must sleep this many hours. It's really these are guidelines. And the guidelines are help are to help us recognize, to 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 look for if, if insufficient sleep may be causing a problem. So with, with uh, you'll notice in those guidelines that there's a range as well. Like sometimes it's two or three hours. So the most, most powerful indicator of how your child is doing, if they're getting enough sleep is, do they have signs of sleepiness during the day? Okay. As long as they don't have signs of sleepiness, then the number of hours is not necessarily a, a, a big concern. Uh, one important caveat there is the signs of sleepiness in children are different than in adults. In adults, if we get sleepy and you know, we start to doze off and we look like we're going to fall asleep, children don't like feeling sleepy. And so they really fight it. And the way they fight it is they'll go from one thing to the next. Yeah. They end up, uh, they're trying to keep themselves stimulated. And so the, the signs of sleepiness in a child are almost exactly the same as the signs of inattention hyperactivity disorder. So if you start to notice those symptoms, the first thing to think about is, is the child getting enough sleep or is there potentially a sleep disorder that's, that's keeping them from getting the sleep that they need? Sure, sure. So why do children resist sleeping? Especially you often hear about a six month old or a seven month old or eight month old looking for parents and not able to fall asleep. What, what are the common reasons for that? And what do parents do to help this child out? And a good as I get to that, other question is they keep waking up at night as well. Right. How long is it okay for them to cry it out? The way we have been taught sleep medicine last 25 years, is it okay to cry them out before we help the child? Yes. So this is a, this is a good question. It's a very common, common question because helping the child sleep is one of the basic things that you're doing, right? right. As, a, as a parent, you have to help make sure that they can get enough food, that they get nutritious food, they get used to eating nutritious food. You also want to help them get used to a healthy sleep pattern. I think the most important thing to recognize here is like, 
children have coded within them, within their genome, the ability to sleep. Uh-huh. Right? There, there aren't like one of the biggest problems that we see is somehow we've come up with this idea that there are good sleepers and there are bad sleepers. Right. Right. We and often they, heard about those. Yeah, and that's usually the first thing that somebody says when they come in. They say, you know, he's never been a good sleeper. Right. And so I, I sometimes will say to them. Has he always been a good walker? Has he always been a good singer? No, these are things that we develop. These are capacities that we develop over time. So the first thing is, if we are confident in the child's ability to sleep, then we approach it very differently, right? But I think in the back of everyone's mind is, oh no, did I get a bad sleeper? So, the, so with that in mind, if, if we can think about the transition to sleep is not the, uh, it, it's not something the parents do to their children. Right. In fact, the only people that put children to sleep are anesthesiologists. Right. Right. Everybody else, all you're doing is you're helping them transition from the daytime to the nighttime. And so their bedtime routine is just signals that they're sending to their child to the child that says, when these things happen in this order, it means bedtime is coming. Children love that, that predictability. They love to know what's going to happen. What's the next thing? The challenge is this. They also know that the parent is the only source of, of, of food, shelter, protection. All the good things that they have come from the parent. If they know that at the end of the bedtime routine, they are not, they're going to lose access to that parent, right. of course, they're going to fight it the whole way. Sure. We often get questions, is teething a common cause of sleeplessness in children, especially between six months to 15 months of age? Is that really true? And what should a parent do? Yeah, so sleep is going to be affected um, by the things that happen during the day, the things that are happening in the child's life. You'll often hear about this idea of a sleep regression that they're losing, that they're losing their uh, their ability to sleep. But that's that's not necessarily true. Usually, what happens is they've actually just developed a new, uh, they've come to a new stage right. that they didn't necessarily have to go through. Peeing would be one thing, but then also like learning how to walk. If it's when the child learns to pull up in the crib. These are all things that we celebrate during the day, right. but it makes it harder to sleep at nighttime. So what we have to think about is not, um, is not that, oh no, their sleep is getting worse. It's what's the advancement that's happening and how do we keep up with it? Sure. So, so when they're teething, you just treat the, you treat the teething and you can expect that they may need some additional comfort at nighttime. Right. What's your advice to the parents that the best comfort method for a child who is waking up at night is to go and feed the child, either breastfeeding uh, or bottle feeding. And can you comment on that? Because sure. is that more like a feedback for the child that the child is getting reward for waking up and so on and so forth. How do we manage this uh, problem in infancy and during the toddler stage? So it's really, it's really a question of uh, just patterns. So usually like what we'll hear is the child goes to sleep fine, but then they wake up throughout the night. Right, right. So what we, say, what we say is like, okay, but how are they falling asleep? So if they fall asleep with a lot of attention and physical proximity to the parent or feeding, if they fall asleep feeding, it doesn't matter what else is happening. Feeding is such an all, like, all-encompassing, like high sensory input uh, state. They won't notice the, the, anything else happening. They won't notice the, like the nursery, like the sounds, like the, anything else. And so... What happens is they fall asleep under those circumstances and then they get put in the, in the crib or in the bed right. or wherever they're going to sleep. And then when they come to the end of a sleep cycle, each of us, all of us, every time we come to the end of a sleep cycle, our brain checks our environment subconsciously to make sure that it's the same as it was when we fell asleep. Right. This is a protective measure that's encoded within us. So what, what happens is they come to the end of a sleep cycle and they're in a different condition than they were when they fell asleep. Right. Right. And so, the, of course, they wake up and they cry because they're, they're, it would be like you falling asleep in your bed and waking up in your kitchen. Right. And you would say, what happened? Why did, and you, you wouldn't just say, well, I guess I'm in the kitchen and then go back to sleep. Right. You would go back and get back to the conditions that were at the beginning of the night, right? So that's usually what, what's happening. It's not that the feeding itself is, is putting them back to sleep. It's that those are the, you're recreating the conditions at the, at the, from the beginning of the night. Sure, sure. So to address that, like that waking up to feed, try and give some distance between the last feeding and when the child is actually awake in bed, able to notice where they are when they fell asleep, they'll be better able to maintain sleep as well. 
Right. Um, you, you looks like to me that some of these sleep issues that we discussed are, are very, very common and probably can be dealt by very simple means. Uh, you mentioned earlier about serious sleep problems. So how does a parent know that there is a serious sleep problem in your child? And then what are the common serious sleep issues that you will talk about to the parents uh, during infancy and when a child is a toddler? What are the things that the parent should worry about? You mentioned, alluded that earlier. Can you elaborate a bit little on that? Yeah, it's a good, good question. So we, we try and distinguish between behavioral sleep issues and organic sleep issues or, or physical sleep issues. Right. Um, both of them can be serious, right? Like, so if you, have, if you have a hard time with your child sleeping, it can impact everybody. It impacts right. the child, impacts the family, and then the family is having a hard time at, at work or whatever. So um, the main distinguishing like, question to help figure out what's going on is, are there circumstances under which your child can sleep well? So like for a behavioral sleep issue, if the child gets what it wants or what, it, what it, it, it's come right. to expect, then they'll sleep. So this is where if they co-sleep, they sleep great. But when they're on their own, they wake up throughout the night and come back. That would be more of a behavioral sleep issue, which would have a different approach. Sure. If, if there are no circumstances under which the child will, will, uh, will sleep. So whether they're co-sleeping, whether they're feeding, whether whatever, they'll, they'll continue to wake up. Um, then we have to start thinking about, are there more uh, physical sleep, sleep issues that would need more evaluation, a medical evaluation, and, and possibly uh, medications or, or a surgery or something like that? Sure. The main one for that would be snoring. So if, if a child is snoring more than three nights a week when they're well, uh, that would be something to talk with your pediatrician about and to consider if there's something else that needs, needs attention. Sure. Can you give us any other examples of a serious problem that a parent should know about their child and sleep? Besides and, snoring, which is, which is what we commonly face in our office. So mm -hmm. snoring, snoring is one. The other would just be pauses in breathing. If you notice that they stop, that they stop breathing uh, frequently throughout the night, those would be something that you'd want, to, uh, you'd want to talk with your pediatrician about. Sometimes pauses in an infant can be okay. They can be normal. But if they're, if they're associated with anything else like whether it's growth problems or, uh, or uh, development, uh, like not moving through the developmental stages the way that they were expected, um, then those, those would be things that I would bring up with, with, the, uh, with your pediatrician. Well, Dr. Lagmani, thank you very much for your wonderful discussion today about common sleep problems that we face in infancy and toddler age groups. Do you have any concluding remarks and advice for our parents and patients who are watching this uh, video? I think most of all, what I, would, what I would suggest is that what you're learning about when you're helping your child sleep is how, to, how, how you and your, your, uh, your child are going, to, are going to work together. Right. It's not something you have to do to the child. You're doing it with them. Right. And what would be the earliest age at which the sleep training should start for an infant? Would it be on day one when the baby is born? Would it be a couple of months? When does the brain start learning about sleep um, that, uh, that uh, you can advise us on? So before, before you can start to have them falling asleep and, and establishing a, a consistent pattern, they have to start to develop their circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm is that period of time where they know that they're supposed to be awake during the day and asleep at nighttime. Right. Usually that's not until like three or four months that that pattern kicks in. Before then, they're just, they're just sleeping and eating. And for that period, there's no, no amount of sleep training is going gonna, is gonna to get you anywhere. Sure. So you wait until at least three or four months. And at that point, you can start to just introduce patterns. And the more consistent those patterns are and the more that they, that they feel comfortable in their sleep environment, the easier it'll be for them to transition to sleep at nighttime and to, to stay asleep through those transitions between sleep stages. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lagmani, for your great sure. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Well, folks, that concludes another episode of Dr. D's Table Talk.